द कंप्लीट वर्क्स ऑफ स्वामी विवेकानंदा भक्ति योग चैप्टर वन डेफिनेशन ऑफ भक्ति भक्ति योग इज अ रियल जेनविन सर्च आफ्टर द लॉर्ड अ सर्च बिगिनिंग कंटिन्यूइंग एंड एंडिंग इन लव वन सिंगल मोमेंट ऑफ द मैडनेस ऑफ एक्सट्रीम लव टू गॉड ब्रिंग्स अस इटर्नल फ्रीडम Bhakti says Narad in his explanation of the bhakti aphorisms is intense love to god when a man gets it he loves all hates none he becomes satisfied forever this love cannot be reduced to any earthly benefit because so long as worldly desires last that kind of love does not come bhakti is greater than karma greater than yoga because these are intended for an object in view while bhakti is its own fruition its own means and its own end bhakti has been one of the constant theme of our own sages apart from the special writers on bhakti such as shandliya or narad the great commentators on the vyasa sutras evidently advocates of knowledge jnana have also something very suggestive to say about love even when the commentator is anxious to explain many if not all of the texts so as to make them import a sort of dry knowledge the sutras in the chapter on worship especially do not lend themselves to be easily manipulated in that fashion there is not really so much difference between knowledge jnana and love bhakti as people sometimes imagine we shall see as we go on that in the end they converge and meet at the same point so also it is with raj yoga which when pursued as a means to attain liberation and not as an instrument to hoodwink the unwary leads us also to the same goal The one great advantage of bhakti is that it is the easiest and most natural way to reach the great divine end in view. Its great disadvantage is that it in its lower forms often times degenerates into hideous fanaticism. The fanatical crew in Hinduism or Mohammedanism or Christianity have almost almost exclusively recruited from these worshippers on the lower planes of bhakti that singleness of attachment nishta to a loved object without which no genuine love can grow is very often the cause of the denunciation of everything else all the weak and underdeveloped minds in every religion or country have only one way of loving their own ideal that is by hating every other ideal herein is the explanation of why the same man who is so lovingly attached to his own ideal of god so devoted to his own ideal of religion becomes a howling fanatic as soon as he sees or hears anything of another ideal this kind of love is somewhat like the canine instinct of guarding the master's property from intrusion only the instinct of the dog is better than the reason of man for the dog never mistakes its master for an enemy in whatever does he may come before it again the fanatic loses all power of judgment personal considerations are in his case of such absorbing interest that to him it is no question at all what a man says whether it is right or wrong but the only thing he is always particularly careful to know is who says it the same man who is kind good honest and loving to people of his own opinion will not hesitate to do the vilest deeds when they are directed against persons beyond the pale of his own religious brotherhood but this danger exists only in that stage of bhakti which is called the preparatory 
gone when bhakti has become ripe and has passed into that form which is called the supreme no more is there any fear of these hideous manifestations of fanaticism that soul which is overpowered by this higher form of bhakti is too near the god of love to become an instrument for the diffusion of hatred it is not given to all of us to be harmonious in the building up of our characters in this life yet we know that that character is the noblest type in which all these three knowledge and love and yoga are harmoniously fused three things are necessary for a bird to fly the two wings and the tail as a rudder for steering jnana knowledge is the one wing bhakti love is the other and yoga is the tail that keeps the balance for those who cannot pursue all these three forms of worship together in harmony and take up therefore bhakti alone as their way it is necessary always to remember that forms and ceremonials though absolutely necessary for the progressive soul have no other value than taking on us on to that state in which we feel the most intense love to god there is little difference in opinion between the te- te- teachers of knowledge and those of love though both admit to the power of bhakti the jnanis hold bhakti to be an instrument of liberation the bhaktas look upon it as both an instrument and as the thing to be attained to my mind there is a distinction without much difference in fact bhakti when used as an instrument really means a lower form of worship and the higher form becomes inseparable from the lower form of realization at a later stage each seems to lay a great stress upon his own peculiar method of worship forgetting that with perfect love true knowledge is bound to become even unsought and that from perfect knowledge true love is inseparable bearing this in mind let us try to understand what the great vedantic commentators have to say on the subject in explaining the sutra avritta sakridu padishat meditation is necessary that having been often enjoyed bhagwan shankara says thus people say he is a devoted to a, the king he is devoted to the guru they say this of him who follows his guru and does so having that following as the one end in view similarly they say the loving wife meditates on her loving husband here also a kind of eager and continuous remembrance is meant this is devotion according to shankara meditation again is a constant remembrance of the thing meditated upon flowing like an unbroken stream of oil poured out from one vessel to another when this kind of remembering has been attained in relation to god all bondages break thus it is spoken of in the scriptures regarding constant remembering as a means to liberation this remembering again is of the same form as seeing because it is of the same meaning as in the passage when he who is far and near is seen the bonds of the heart are broken all doubts vanish and all effects of work disappear he who is near can be seen but he who is far can only be remembered nevertheless the scripture says that he have to see him who is near as well as him who is as far thereby to us that the above kind of remembering is as good as seen this remembrance when exalted assumes the same form as seen worship is the constant remembering as may be seen from the essential text of the scriptures knowing which is the same as repeated worship has been described as constant remembering 
Thus, the memory which has attained to the height of what is as good as direct perception is spoken of in the Shruti as a means of liberation. This Atman is not to be reached through various sciences, nor by intellect, nor by much study of the Vedas. Whomsoever this Atman desires, by him is Atman attained, and to him this Atman discovers himself. Here, after saying that mere hearing, thinking and meditating are not the means of attaining this Atman, it is said, whom this Atman desires, by him the Atman is attained. The extremely beloved is desired. By whomsoever this Atman is extremely beloved, he becomes the most beloved of the Atman. So that this beloved may attain the Atman, the Lord himself helps. For it has been said by the Lord, those who are constantly attached to me and worship me with love, I give them that direction to their will by which they come to me. Therefore it is said that to whomsoever this remembering which is of the same form as direct perception is very dear because it is dear to the object of such memory perception. He is desi desired by the Supreme Atman. By him the Supreme Atman is attained. This constant remembrance is denoted by the word Bhakti. So says Bhagwan Ramanuja in his commentary on the Sutra Atho Brahma Ninyasa. Hence follows the dissertation on Brahman. In commenting on the Sutra of Patanjali, Ishwar, Pranidhandva, that is, or by the worship of the Supreme Lord, Bhuja says, Pranidhana is that sort of bhakti in which, without seeking results, such as sense enjoy enjoyments, etc., all works are dedicated to that teacher of teachers. Bhagwan Vyasa also, when commenting on the scene, defines Pranidhan as a form of bhakti by which the mercy of the Supreme Lord comes to the yogi and blesses him by granting him his desires. According to Shandilya, bhakti is intense love to God. The best definition is, however, that given by the king of bhaktas, Prahlad. That deathless love which the ignorant have for the fleeting objects of the senses. As I keep meditating on thee, may not that love slip away from my heart. Love for whom? For the Supreme Lord Ishwara. Love for any other being, however great, cannot be bhakti. For as Ramanuja says in his Sri Bhasha, quoting an ancient Acharya, that is a great teacher, from Brahma, to a clump of grass, all things that live in the world are slaves of birth and death caused by karma. Therefore, they cannot be helpful as objects of meditation, because they are all in ignorance and subject to change. In commenting on the word anuratti used by Shandriya, the commentator Swapneshwara says that it means anu after and ratti attachment. That is the attachment which comes after the knowledge of the nature and glory of God. Else, a blind attachment to anyone, that is, to wife or children, would be bhakti. We plainly see, therefore, that bhakti is a series of succession of mental efforts at religious realization, beginning with ordinary worship and ending in a supreme intensity of love for Ishwara.